Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I have a different kind of video. I am doing my very first whips and myths and this is video number one. So a whip first off is work in progress and today I just happen to be working on a diamond painting but in the future I will be switching it up every once in a while with other things that I'm in the mood to work on. So feel free to pull out something that you're working on and you can come and join me or you can just easily listen as well. Um, but definitely you can grab a snack because this is going to be hopefully a little, a little long, but we'll see. I did put a poll up on my YouTube channel the other day asking what video format to record this in and it was between the work with a seamless voiceover which ended up getting the most votes and it was against a few votes for one unedited cut. So thank you for everyone who voted and it did really help me out by solidifying what I really wanted to do. I could switch up this format in the future too, but I think this is a great starting point for now and we'll see how it goes. But let me go ahead and lay out the details on what I'm working on today before we get started. So I'm doing a diamond painting. It's called Harry Stained Glass and it's by Diamond Dots. This is a 20 by 28 inch uh, canvas. And it's got 10 colors with one AB, which is Aurora Borealis. And you know, that extra sparkly stuff that makes them extra sparkly. The pen that I'm using is by Stacy Paradin, and she is at Diamond Painting Pens on Facebook. And I was really happy with it. The needle minder is from Shine Shop Designs by Shine Like a Diamond. The containers I'm using are by Harbor Freights. And that's basically for the most part what I'm working with today. So I'm just going to give a quick intro and I won't be doing this every video, but I wanted to explain where this idea is coming from. So what is this video about? What am I talking about today? I am planning to do this series of sort of whipping chats, so to speak, but in a story time telling myths instead of chatting since my life isn't anything like the real world or desperate housewives or keeping up with the kardashians i am not i don't do anything but i knew i wanted to do a sort of whip and chat maybe with a point of interest and I got the idea from Bailey Sarian, which she does like true crime videos and she's really big on YouTube. And then Robert Welsh, he does makeup usually, but he also does a series of ghost stories while he does his makeup. So I really enjoy both of those. And like I said, the idea kind of sprang from that but I didn't want to follow in their footsteps kind of a thing. I wanted to do my own, especially when there's so many like really good true crime, you know, videos and podcasts and stuff like that. And I like true crime. I like to listen to it, but it's not something I'm passionate about. And the ghost stories, I really love the ghost stories, but I just feel like that's his thing and I don't want to be like copycat status. So... <laughs> Uh, so one day I just was going through my books and I realized I had about four books about Greek mythology and I just recently bought a fifth one and it just hit me that I really love Greek mythology and since I was about to relive the stories and read these books again because I'm truly fascinated by it and they're some of my most favorite stories there, there are just so many and I don't really know all of them or I have forgotten them. So I figured since I wouldn't normally do a chat, I 
figured maybe I could retell stories and hopefully my love for mythology will show through and intrigue you to want to listen in and learn about the crazy dreamy fantasy that people used to explain natural phenomenon. I'm going to be starting out with Greek mythology or it's actually a bit of Greek mixed with Roman mythology from what I was reading depending on the source I was reading it from but depending how this all goes I plan to venture into other regions. I've always wanted to read more about Egyptian mythology and Nordic with like Thor and Loki so if this is something you're interested in leave me a comment below or a like so I know I'm going in the right direction with this. I mean Greek has a lot so it's gonna take a bit to get through all the Greek stuff but just like I said just in case I have a plan of action for the future. So these are the books that I'm using and I'll try to link them down below if I can find them all. My newest is a small book but I wanted it because it contains modern annotations such as this one right here it says and I quote Pegasus is one flying horse named Pegasus flying horses in general are not referred to as Pegasus or Pegasi there is more than one flying horse in Greek mythology but only one is called Pegasus so it has some really cool little tidbits like that in it and the writing itself is very sarcastic and hilarious um, so I'm really loving this little book it's a great little kind of excerpt of each little story and uh, Olympian and everything like that so I'm really happy that I picked this up and the book itself is beautiful it's got great artwork the covers have like gold and it's just it's stunning it's a beautiful book I will also leave the websites that I looked at for further information down below too in case you would like to read any of that. I did pull bits and pieces that I really liked from the different sources that made the most dramatics since there are so many retellings that they all kind of vary slightly. I am not, repeat, I am not a historian or have studied any of this. I am just a fangirl. So don't come for me if there is something completely off. I did do a bit of research so that I could fill in as much as I could from where each book was lacking. Um, so I, that's where the web pages come in, but you know, we never know how 100% accurate things are on the internet. You shouldn't believe everything you read. I did try my best to get as much accurate information as I could, but I just, I don't know. So also one more side note, I may or may not be pronouncing some or all of the names correctly. So once again, just sorry about that as well. This is merely for entertainment purposes and you can always politely tell me any corrections in the comments because I'm always willing to hear what really happened. So now that that is all said and done, we are gonna get started at the very beginning. So we're gonna start with the creation. In the beginning, there was chaos. Now chaos, they are referring to as a deity and not just like chaos it's it's an actual deity not a thing and chaos was just a giant mass of nothing and darkness who came into existence when the cosmos was born cosmos universe same difference so chaos in Greek actually does mean abyss and it's loosely translated to gap as well and essentially this is what chaos rules over the gap between the earth and the heavens and the underworld so right in the middle of everything chaos was thought to be more female even though it had no physical form 
and she also played the role of fate. So chaos, fate, I don't know about that, but apparently it worked out for the Greeks. So later on in history, she is said to be the origin of everything. Everything being the elements, the earth, the water, air, fire. Okay, so she, she pretty much is where everything comes from, supposedly. And not long after chaos came to be, out springs Gaia. No one really knows how, if it was out of nothing, if she just was there, or if she maybe came from chaos. Chaos birthed her out or something, or created her. No one knows. But she is Earth, basically. And she's then followed by Tartarus, who is the underworld, and Eros, who is love. They are believed to be the very first generation of gods. For one reason or another, it didn't take long for Gaia to grow lonely. I don't know. I mean, she's new. You'd think she'd have like her family there that she can, well, I guess their supposed family to keep her company. But I think this is talking romantically now. And because next thing you know, she gets a bright idea that she's going to create someone to keep her company and ends up creating herself a husband. I mean, she's young. So, you know, when you're young, your hormones are raging. <laughs> and, you know, you get that feeling where you need someone to be someone because you don't know who you are. So it makes sense. I can see it. She's, she's, she's young and dumb. And mistakes were made, which we'll get on to. We'll get into that in a little bit. Her husband turns out to be Oranos, a.k.a. Uranus. <laughs> this should have already been a red flag right here. So I don't know how we don't see this next part coming. But Uranos, he's the sky. He's gigantic and blue. He's littered with stars, twinkling away, just as we know it today. You picture the sky, that's what he is. She created him to be her equal in power, and he stretched just as far as she did above him. Of course, he was stunning, you know, with all the stars and the blues and She's just laying there staring up at him all day. So inevitably, she fell in love with him. He is the heavens, just as how you've heard it described, right? So I really don't blame her. He's the heavens. I mean, who can fall in love with the heavens? It's supposed to be amazing and magical and beautiful. So she gets her happy ending and they end up getting married. According to to the New World Encyclopedia, and I quote, Uranus faithfully lowered himself to Earth to make love with Gaia, showering her with fertile rain. So romantic. Eventually, Gaia becomes pregnant, and she gave birth to her first set of children, thus giving her the name Mother Earth and Oranos, Father Sky. Now their first children were called the Titans, and they were also referred to as the Elder Gods. They were enormous, human-like, supreme beings. Okay, so everything that makes the amazing, amazing. They basically all looked the same, and the only difference was their names are what set them apart. So, I mean, I don't know how you would tell them apart, but they're different because of their names. Six of them were male titans, so we have Oceanus, Hyperion, Coeus, Creus, Iapetus, and Cronus. And then there were their six titan-s sisters, Themis, Phoebe, Mnemosyne, or Mnemosyne, Thea, Tethys, and Rhea who were meant to be their wives. Not weird at all. Not all of the Titans have much known about them. It's only a select few that are like the popular ones that actually have stories written about them. A lot of them are just known by their names, essentially. 
But Oranos and Gaia were the proudest parents and thought their children were the greatest creations ever. You know, you have kids, you know. To you, your kids are the most amazing creation that's ever been made. <laughs> Except for me, my youngest is a little demon monster. But that's a story for another day. So everything is right and just for a while. Again, Gaia got pregnant and this time she gave birth to three Cyclopses. There was Argus, who was thunder, Sterope, who was lightning, and Brontis, who was thunderbolt. They were Cyclopses, so they would be how you imagine them, huge, with the one big eye in the middle of their foreheads. I always think of um, Sinbad when he's fighting the Cyclops. Is that what it is? And it's like a claymation. It's a very old movie. I just dated myself, but that's what I usually think of when I think of Cyclopses. So Cyclopses loosely translate to mean round eye. And for the most part, they are super duper ugly and Oranos starts to show his true colors because he does not like that they're ugly. He just had 12 glorious, stunning kids, and now he's got these ugly ones. And he's just, I don't know, he's starting to sound super vain now. But I don't know, like, he's just over here like, ugh, like disgusting to his kids. I don't know. He's, he's, he's all, all of a sudden made a 180, 180 direction here for being the heavens. So much for him being like heavenly. Well, the Cyclopses weren't useless. They were extremely talented blacksmiths. And it's said that when they worked, that they lit up the heavens and the sky with like lightning. And it was so bright and stunning so much that even the stars lost their glow and like their radiance and you couldn't really see them anymore. So this royally pisses off Oranos now. So they're not sitting on his good side at all. The last set of children that Gaia gave birth to is the three Hecatonchires. Hecatonchires means hundred-handed ones. There was Briarius or Aegean meaning the vigorous, Cotus, meaning the furious, and Gyges, meaning the big limbed. They were each born with a hundred hands and fifty heads. What? Why why an even number either? Like I would think that they would be like an odd number or like a half, maybe, or a quarter. But no, a hundred hands, fifty heads. Three of them. And they were the ones that caused earthquakes and huge giant sea waves. Now, if the Cyclopses were ugh, then to Oranos, these guys were trash. He couldn't stand seeing these super disgusting things walking over the most beautiful Gaia Earth, right? He's like in love with Gaia, supposedly, and they're just they're making her ugly so he's like nope he at some point declares himself king of the cosmos king of the universe and he goes and takes matters into his own hands and scoops up the hecatonchires and tosses them into tartarus and tartarus is a deep and dark pit in the earth and it's also been described as gaia's uterus which is weird because that's supposed to be her brother, right? I don't know how that works, but I'm telling you, there was different, different parts of stories and different research. Yeah, I don't know. Tartarus, uterus, okay. Locks him up. He also throws the Cyclopses in after them and is glad to finally be done with them too. So two birds, one stone. So now we're remembering how Gaia was young and dumb and made mistakes She's probably regretting the whole create a husband thing right now. <laughs> Obviously, she didn't know him as well as she thought she did. Total Lifetime movie vibes right now. But she absolutely loved and adored all her children. I mean, what mother wouldn't, right? 
what is that saying? A face only a mother could love? Come on. <laughs> so she was extremely upset about this whole thing. She didn't even feel good literally because it was painful having him there inside of her. He was being cruel and she just couldn't forgive him. So the plotting begins. Gaia decides to make a sickle out of adamantine, which is like a unbreakable sort of metal kind of thing. And it's a sickle now, okay? And she takes it to her Titan children and asks them to help her to kill their father with it and to set their brothers free. All of them are like, no way, freaked out at such a request and they're afraid of their father's wrath. He's like the strongest guy in the universe. He's the king. But only one is brave enough to step forward. Cronus, who is the youngest, also pronounced Kronos, but we're gonna stick with Kronos in this story. He is the strongest of them all. The youngest, but the strongest. And deep down, he is power hungry and he secretly dreams of taking over the universe. Like a pinky in the brain kind of thing going on here. So this is his opportunity to take over. He takes the sickle, he goes down in a different part of Gaia's womb and he waits for Aranos to make an appearance so he can do a sneak attack, total ninja status. He fortunately doesn't have to wait very long Arano shows up that night because he's going down to get it on with Gaia again. And sure enough, Aranos is caught off guard. And here we go. Are you ready? Cronus uses the sickle to castrate Aranos. Like, what? <laughs> what is going on here? Okay, so Cronus grabs up the now severed body part mm -hmm, and throws it into the sea, chucks it, gone. From Uranus's blood that falls to the earth, I'm assuming this is when it's flying through the air. <laughs> you can imagine that. <laughs> I just got an image, I'm sorry. One moment. So the blood that's trickling to the earth out comes the Aranes or the Furies. And these are three women who devote their lives to punishing sinners, super evil ladies, right? I'm interested in their story. We're gonna get to them another day. Then comes the giants and these guys are bloodthirsty and they're incredibly strong. And last are the Malii who are nymphs of the Ash Woodlands. And then meanwhile, the blood that fell into the sea gave birth to the goddess Amphrodite. Again, what? <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> I didn't know how she was came to be. I didn't know how she was came to be. Some people say Zeus is her father. Um, I don't know. This way is, my, is way more interesting. Way more interesting. Anyways, so she's born. She exists. We'll get to her another day. Going back to Cronus now, he frees all the brothers and allows Oranos to go back up to the heavens since he's basically lost almost all his power now. Being the sore loser that Oranos is, on his way back up, he spits out a prophecy saying, just like he was overthrown by his son, a son of Cronus will overthrow him too. So he goes, he's gone, goodbye. Everyone's happy now. They all recognize Cronus as king of the universe. So he gets his secret little wish, his, uh, well, I guess it's not a guilty pleasure, but <laughs> he wanted to rule the world, rule the, sorry, rule the universe. So he got his, he got his wish, he got his wish. He ends up marrying his sister Rhea, course because they were meant to be together right and everything is once again right and just Cronus is a good ruler 
Gaia is bountiful. She's, you know, creating food and plants are growing and, you know, the world is great and creatures are worshiping him and everyone's enjoying this peaceful, pleasant life that they're living. But all good things come to an end. At some point, Cronus starts to change. Apparently, Uranus's prophecy is like slowly eating away at Cronus's mind. He starts to become suspicious, anxious, paranoid of some kind of rebellion or being overthrown. So eventually, he starts to become the dark and twisted guy like his dad, like his father. And he's heading down that dark path. He ends up throwing the Cyclopses and the Hecatonchires back into Tartarus, where Kemp, the dragoness, guards them. So this, once again, makes Gaia angry. After everything that he's, they've all been through, how could he do this? And she's really getting fed up with all this nonsense. And she wants her power back, right? Because she was like the first one after chaos. So now she's like, she's falling down the ladder. She's like at the bottom, like getting toward the bottom of the pyramid now. But she knows that Cronus is just too strong. He's, you know, her husband was stronger than her. And the son was supposed to defeat him. So of course, like she knows, like she's not dumb. Well, not at this moment anyway. <laughs> But she knows that Cronus is, you know, she can't go up against him. So what does she do? She starts to plan. We all know what happened last time she was planning, but she's she's got her plan. She's a planner. I'm a planner. I'm a Capricorn. I plan. So I understand her planning methods. She's looking at the bigger picture. Totally get it. Cronus knew that one day his son would overthrow him because of the prophecy. So he's got a plan of his own. As soon as him and Rhea start having kids of their own, she would give birth and Cronus would come, take the baby, and legit swallow it whole. Child after child, he would do this. Like swallowed it whole. Like opened his mouth. I don't know how, I mean, this, these babies must be tiny. But he opens his mouth, pops it in, swallows it whole like a pill. So here he is on his like high and mighty chair thinking he bested his destiny, but not for long. Rhea, having all five of her children eaten, is distraught. I mean, I would too. I'm going through all that pregnancy and then two seconds later your kid is swallowed whole. Like, I get it. All of her sisters are now surrounded by children. And here she is, knowing that her husband would never allow her to have any children. To live, anyways. She can have the children, they just would live very long. So now she's growing tired of Cronus and his antics. And she's done dealing with this crap. So she turns to the only person that can help her. I'm sure you know who that is. It's Gaia. And she is ready. She's got her plan. She's ready to go. So she told Rhea that when she has her sixth baby, she will whisk it away and hide it so far that its father can never find it. The day finally comes. Rhea gives birth to her sixth child. She hides him, stores him away, goes back, and instead takes a stone, wraps it in clothes to disguise it. So now it looks like a little baby. Cronus comes to eat the child like usual and is totally fooled in thinking that the stone is the child and eats it. What a sucker. Did he not even look? I guess he don't care. He just pops him in. He's like, the sooner they're gone, the better. Soon after, Rhea takes the baby, who is now named Zeus, to Mount Ida on Earth on the island of Crete. So now life is going on and Zeus is over here being raised by nymphs. Amalathia, the fairy goat, was the one that nursed him. 
and its horns gave him ambrosia and nectar, which is the food and drink of the gods. He grew super fast and super duper strong. And this is where he ends up meeting Metis, the goddess of wisdom. And she is also the daughter of a Titan and they get married. Soon enough, he's ready to go. He's grown up. I don't know if he's trained, but he's super strong and he's pretty much ready to go and take down Cronus. So he meets with Metis and she pops out a plan for him because she's like super wise. So it makes sense. He's very smart and going to her to get a plan made because that's her deal. She's wisdom. She tells him, go disguise yourself as an Olympian cupbearer and give him poisoned wine. Super easy, right? So before he leaves, you know, on his big old mission, he thanks the nymphs and he leaves them with the horns from the fairy goat. So I'm assuming he slaughtered it at this point. And they're enchanted to never empty. So forever and ever, they're going to pour uh, the ambrosia and nectar. So forever, they're going to pour the food and drink of the gods. And then he takes the goat's hide and he makes himself a breastplate. And this breastplate is impenetrable. So this makes him the super scary guy that Cronus is afraid of now. So he heads out, he gets to the palace. Rhea, his mother, is there to help him. And she helps Zeus sneak in. And so he goes and does his thing with the wine. He brings it up to Cronus and he's able to trick him into drinking it. Well, the wine makes Cronus throw up like a lot of throw up, super projectile vomit throwing up. Just kidding. But that's what I imagine because next thing you know, all five of his brothers and sisters and the stone get regurgitated out. So I'm thinking it's got to be some of that like intense spoof movie type of vomit. I can never watch those, but they usually have a scene where someone's throwing up like that. So now we have Poseidon, Hades, Hera, Demeter, and Hestia, who are, for lack of a better word, reborn. Cronus now realizes that he's up against all of them. So he decides it's not worth it. I give up. He forfeits his powers and they all imprison him. So here we go again. Zeus is now recognized as king of the universe. Graciously though, Zeus also shares his power with his brothers and sisters so that they can all rule together. Super nice of him. Although there's a lot of stories where he's pretty douchey. So just gonna throw that out there. Yet not everyone is happy about this. All the Titans and their sons don't wanna live under his rule or the other new gods rule because they believe that they're above them and they want their seniority back. All except for the Titans Prometheus, Epimetheus, and Oceanus, who decide to take Zeus's side. Prometheus was super wise and he could also see the future. And he ended up seeing that Zeus would win in the end. So that's basically, he was just like, this guy's gonna win, I'm gonna be over there. Like, forget you guys, I'm not, I'm not about it. Not about that life. And so begins the 10 year war between the Titans who was led by Atlas and the gods led by Zeus. And the name for this war is called the Titanomachy. So they're both evenly matched groups with other gods and Titans joining as time goes on. So it's getting bigger and bigger on both sides. You know, it's 10 years. So people are gonna decide who they wanna be. Gaia, eventually intervenes with yet another plan. I like this girl, she's consistent. <laughs> and she's pretty certain that this will help the gods win, this plan that she has. So Zeus hears the plan out, agrees, heads over to Tartarus, fights and kills Camp, because remember Camp is the, the guard, the dragoness guard. He frees the Hecatonchires and the Cyclopses. So to show their gratitude, the Hecatonchires gave Zeus 
their strength by throwing things like mountains and you know big rocks because they're super strong and the cyclopses make weapons for Zeus and his brothers. So this is where Poseidon gets his trident that we all see him with. Hades gets a helmet of invisibility. And of course, this is when Zeus gets his signature thunderbolts, which makes him gain max level strength, right? So Zeus and the gods get back into the fight with their new allies, and they've got these cool weapons now. And they're led by Nike, who is the god of victory, I did not know that. Fun fact, I had no idea that Nike was a Greek god. And the meaning makes a lot of sense for their company now. That's pretty smart. I like that. So thunderbolts and mountains, they're going everywhere, right? Flying, craziness, all at war. In the end, supposedly, on one of the days, Hades wore his helmet of invisibility and snuck into the Titans' home base on Mount Arthurus, where he destroyed all their weapons and armor. So conveniently, without them, the Titans couldn't fight anymore. And the war ended. Afterwards, all of the male Titans were sent to Tartarus, minus, you know, Prometheus, Epimetheus, and Oceanus, obviously. And all the female Titans weren't involved, so they were good. They were just living their best lives. New gates were created by Poseidon and the Cyclopses to keep them trapped there. And Hecatonchires were given the job to guard them since they're uber duper strong. Only Atlas got a special punishment because he was the leader of the Titans. And Zeus just had it out for him, I guess. So he pretty much makes Atlas hold up the sky on his shoulders for all eternity. Pretty ruthless. And it's even funnier knowing that it's Oranos that he's holding up. So we all know the guy holding the world on his back on his shoulders. So now that the war is over, the gods move their home base to Mount Olympus which is the highest mountain in Greece. And everyone who lives there is now called an Olympian. The Cyclopses also moved up there and they made tons of forges in the volcanoes. And that's where they spent all of their days being craftsmen. So Zeus and his brothers Poseidon and Hades, they divide up the universe between them using none other than the method of drawing straws. <laughs> so Zeus of course wins didn't see that coming and he becomes the king of the sky and the mortals and the gods Poseidon got to be the ruler of the seas and Hades who unfortunately is a loser in the straw game because he drew the smallest straw becomes lord of the underworld so Zeus's allies were also rewarded. Oceanus was able to keep his position as the god of fresh water. Prometheus and Epimetheus were given a very important job. They were to bring life to earth, aka humans. I don't know if it's specifically like they made the human or they brought the life to humans. Either way, they, they had a big hand in the making of humans. So not so bad, not a bad turnout. And Styx, who was also an ally during the war, he made her a super powerful river goddess whose name was used in unbreakable oaths. And all of her children that she will have will have very high positions on Mount Olympus. In the end, there's always one person who's never happy and has to ruin it for everyone else. Gaia, I know you forgot about her, but now she's happy that her sons were released from Tartarus, but she's also angry because they were just replaced with her other sons. So she ends up sleeping with her brother, Tartarus, and births a monster. Yes, I know. This one is the worst. Makes sense. And he's the most 
horrible looking one yet. Makes sense. The monster's name was Typhon, the father of all monsters. And he was described as a fire breathing dragon, but not an ordinary dragon. He has a hundred heads that could touch the stars. His creepy eyes dripped venom and he had a gaping mouth that lava poured from. On top of his main head, he had a hundred snake heads that would each make animal sounds. He had the torso of a man and was covered in hundreds of different wings. His hands and legs were coils upon coils of vipers. Although in some versions, it says his legs were two vipers. But I think the coils and coils of vipers is much more dramatic. The creature then heads to Mount Olympus, where he freaks everybody out. Everyone is terrified of what they are seeing. They all make a run for it. I would too. That sounds, I can't even imagine what this guy looks like. I can, but I can't. I can't, I can't believe it's real, but I guess it's not, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Typhon starts to tear up the mountain, trying to destroy everything. Zeus, who is the big badass that he is, believes that he can take him on. Although in some stories, Athena supposedly calls him a coward, and this makes him man up and take on Typhon. And I believe that more than him just like being, I'm high and mighty. I think he probably ran off. Either way, he enters a giant battle with Typhon. It nearly wipes out almost all the living creatures on Earth. Typhon goes and tears up a huge mountain named Mount Etna. And it's at this moment that Zeus makes a massive power move and shoots a hundred bolts of lightning straight at Typhon. It was just enough to make Typhon fall backwards and the mountain lands right on top of him. And to this day, that's where they say he lies, spewing lava and fire and smoke out of the top. So essentially he's a volcano now. That's where volcanoes come from, or at least that volcano. In the end, Gaia does try a final attempt to overthrow Zeus because of her anger, because she's still angry. She persuades the giants to fight for her and sends them to get rid of Zeus. So she sends the giants. This is also another giant war in which I will get into at another time. But long story short, the Olympians prevail. The 12 Olympians sit on their thrones in Mount Olympus and they rule over the universe. And now the stories of the Olympians can really begin. So what can we take away from this story so far? That maybe we should all be more like Gaia? Like, uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Or uh, don't give up. Or fight for what you believe in. Uh, no matter who you are, we all do stupid things when we're young. The perfect man, woman doesn't exist. And that's okay. <laughs> But I will leave that here in my next Whips and Myths. I will be diving into the 12 Olympians and their backstories since that's where all the books I have and the interwebs uh, get straight into after the creation. So if you really enjoyed this, I hope you come back for number two. I don't know if I'm going to be doing this every like two weeks maybe. I'm not sure yet, but I definitely want to keep them pretty consistent. It just takes a bit to do all the research and type everything out. So I'm thinking every two weeks, but we'll see. If I can get it sooner, I will try to. Um, but otherwise, I hope you got some work done. And thank you so much for watching and listening. And I will see you guys all in the next one. Bye!